Hi, good evening everyone and welcome to today's uh, panel. Uh, thank you all for coming. So please turn off your mobile phones. I just did mine on silent now or turn them on silent. Um, a recording of this evening's event will be up on our website soon, within a week or whenever we get uh, our material. Uh, please sign up for our mailing list if you haven't done so already. We have a paper outside uh, and we already have we or we have a QR code, right? At some place as well. Um, and you can also sign up to our social media. It's uh, at CIRSGUQ, that's on Twitter, um, and Instagram and Facebook. And after the discussion, we will have a reception outside, so please join us for that. So, without further ado, I will introduce our speakers for tonight. Hissa El Kubesi graduated from Georgetown University in Qatar in 2022. She received a degree in international politics with honors and a minor in Arabic. She authored a thesis titled Leadership Transitions and Foreign Policy Shifts, the Cases of Qatar and the UAE. Irene Theodoropoulou, Oh, excellent, is Associate Professor of Linguistics at Qatar University. She's author of Sociolinguistics of Speech Style and Social Class in Contemporary Athens and is co-editor of the Research Companion to Language and Country Branding. And finally, Dr. Daniel Reiche is, Reiche, correct, is visiting associate professor at Georgetown University in Qatar and a research fellow at CIRS, where he leads the initiative on the FIFA Qatar World Cup titled Building a Legacy. He is co-author of Qatar and the 2022 FIFA World Cup, Politics, Controversy, Change, and co-editor of the Handbook of Sport in the Middle East. So what I'm gonna do is ask one round of questions to our panelists, and they're going to talk for about five minutes each, and then we will open the floor to questions from the audience. So Hessa, we'll start with you. So in the advertising, Qatar has said that this is a World Cup for the Middle East and not just for Qatar. Even though all 32 World Cup teams are hosted in Qatar and all 64 games will be played in Qatar. In what ways would the Middle East region benefit from Qatar's hosting of the World Cup? Um, so this year it'll be the first time that the Middle East region would ever be given the opportunity to host such a mega sporting event, uh, such as the FIFA 2022 World Cup. And um, I believe it's, um, it is very important for both Qatar and the region as a whole, uh, because it, has, it creates this kind of spillover effect. And one good example to really look at is housing. So it's estimated that more like 1 million uh, visiting fans are expected to come to Qatar during the FIFA 2022 World Cup. And that paired along with factors such as the cost of lodging here and um, the fact that uh, most of the luxurious hotels are being re rented out for FIFA officials and um, the football players. It's very clear to see that Qatar's 31,000 uh, hotel rooms are outnumbered. And so it's clear to see that this is where we would expect a boost in regional coordination efforts, where they would um, expect it to use, make use of traveling outside of Qatar to the UAE and like popular destinations like uh, Masqat, Dubai, Riyadh, and so. And this is where like the regional airlines would also benefit from uh, this uh, experience. And Fly Dubai and Air Arabia have like 45 uh, operating flights daily to Doha. And so they're really seizing this opportunity of a huge uh, profit opportunity. And um, this is just one like example. Thank you. So Irene, we heard about the benefits for the Middle East. What is, is there anything very distinctly Qatari about the way the World Cup has been designed and promoted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
I mean, that's always a question that, that takes us back to issues of identity. Uh, I think that apart from the fact that the whole tournament actually, oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, apart from the fact that the whole tournament will be hosted in Qatar, I think that also in terms of designing, in terms of uh, strategi strategizing the, the event, I think that there is actually, there are lots of Qatari elements there, which are of course enmeshed with the Middle East. They're also enmeshed with the Gulf as well. But uh, I believe actually that there are very, very specific uh, Qatar-based elements. Uh, the most basic of which actually is the architecture of the stadiums. So if we look at the architecture of the stadiums, actually we will see lots of visual, but also linguistic references to what Qatar has been trying to promote as the Qatari identity. So for example, we have the Al Bayt Stadium, whose design has been inspired by the Bedouin culture, by the Beit al Sha'ar, the, the Bedouin house. Uh, so we have a very clear reference to the Bedouin aspect of the Qatari identity, which of course is also relevant to the Gulf, right? Uh, but apart from the Bedouin aspect, we also have lots of references to the Hadari element of the Qatari identity. This becomes very evident if we look at, let's say, the architecture of the Al Janoub Stadium, uh, which makes again a very clear reference reference to the, the pearl fishing uh, culture. So these are actually two of, in my humble opinion, the most important uh, aspects of the Qatar identity, which, by the way, we can also see in the National Museum of Qatar. Uh, so the, and of course we also have references that apply more to the Arab world from the architecture of the stadiums. We have, for example, the Al Thumama Stadium, which as you probably know has been inspired by the Gahfiya. This is the hat actually that is worn as part of the, the Qatari male dress, especially here in the Gulf, but also beyond the Gulf. Um, so architecture is one domain where we see actually a distinctive uh, Qatariness. Uh, another very interesting aspect is uh, the mascot, uh, you know, Laib, this very cute uh, guy. At uh, first, actually, I think all of us were baffled. We were trying to understand what exactly this is. Is it uh, a ghost? <laughs> How does it work? But if you read actually the FIVA website, you will see that it is a very strategically designed um, uh, mascot, and it has actually a lot of Qatari element in it. First of all, the name Laib itself. I was told by my students that this is a word that is used in the Gulf, uh, but it is very distinctive also in the Qatari dialect as well. It means a super skilled player. And of course, again, the associations can be very evident. Uh, it wants to, pro the Qatar wants to promote the fact that, uh, you know, it will bring the best players and by extension, one could argue that this is a message, especially to younger generations, that they can aspire to become, you know, very skillful in whatever they decide to do. Uh, also, we have, again, other visual references uh, to the male Qatari dress. I mean, if you see the, the clothing of uh, Laib, you will see actually that we have the male gutra. And we also have some designs, again, that are Islamic designs, the ones that you will find uh, on the Hutra itself. Um, so this is another Qatari element. And uh, last but not least, I would say that this Qatari character is also evident in the sustainable development that Qatar has tried to associate with the World Cup, right? So I'm pretty sure that you have read news about how the stadiums will have some really high-tech technology pertinent to cooling the stadiums, uh, pertinent to how to identify offside uh, phases in the pitch. Uh, also, high-end tech high technology will be used in terms of how to manage people when they exit and when they uh, enter into the stadium. So all of these actually are considered to be uh, unique, actually, in the whole branding process of Qatar. Qatar is really proud of you know, the fact that we have this use of technology. Um, and of course, last but not least, we should not forget about the legacy, right? Which, again, in my humble opinion, is something 
that is Qatar-based but very Middle Eastern oriented uh, in the sense that one of the core features of legacy has to do with helping other countries. So we know actually that especially the 974 uh, stadium, which uh, is made out of containers, will be disassembled and then uh, all of these containers actually will be sent to uh, countries in Africa and uh, in Asia. Uh, so basically the idea is that Qatar will try to spread the culture of football, right? Uh, and this is also something that is associated with issues of hospitality, issues uh, of charity, right? Which are at the core of, uh, you know, the Qatari culture and the Qatari identity. So these are just some of the features that, uh, in my humble opinion, make the, the World Cup 2022 Qatar-based but Middle Eastern oriented. Uh, and of course, I think that all of us are really looking forward to seeing how things will develop. Thank you, Irene. And Daniel, so Qatar in its advertising has emphasized that this is the 2022 World Cup is a World Cup for the Middle East, for Arab nations, for Muslim nations. Is this, to what extent is this true or is it mainly serving national uh, political interests? I would argue it's a Qatari World Cup with some regional flavor. Uh, and Hissa discussed the regional flavors. Uh, but overall, um, the entire investments into sports and culminating in the World Cup are integrated into Qatar National Vision 2030, which aims that the country is becoming an advanced country by 2030. Uh, lots of investments have happened over the last years and the metro or the port or the airport, all of this is not happening because of the World Cup. The World Cup just sets the timeline when to accomplish these projects. So the World Cup serves uh, domestic uh, development and advancement of the country. And of course, also other purposes like economic diversification and uh, contributing to a healthy society aims that are outlined in Qatar National Vision 2030. But um, so it's a domestic, for, but it's also a foreign policy tool. And uh, Qatar is a small state. And by investing into sports, something Qatar is doing now since 30 years. The first was the ATP tennis tournament in 1993, won by a German, Boris Becker. Um, so since around 30 years, Qatar is investing into international sporting events to overcome the invisibility of a small state. So in our podcast series, we had an interview with a coach who is here since 1982. And he said when he was traveling in the 80s and 90s, nobody knew Qatar. And he even made the jokes that once he was asked whether Qatar is a washing powder. So nobody thinks anymore Qatar is a washing powder. Everybody knows Qatar now. And of course, it's also about gaining state power. Um, Qatar is a small country with a small military. Its security mainly relies on the US. So it's focusing on economic and soft power and sport contributes to uh, being perceived as an attractive uh, destination. And it's also, and this is unique to Qatar, contributing to the country's national security. So since uh, Kuwait was invaded by Iraq in 1990, uh, it became obvious the vulnerability of a small state like Qatar and sport is an uh, avenue for uh, interconnectedness with the rest of the world. So there are all the time international sporting events here. People from around the world are here in Qatar. Uh, heads of state or ministers or politicians might come to attend this event. So it's connecting Qatar to the rest of the world. So um, finally, I would say that um, so far, sport has been a tool for interregional competition and distinction. And the story for sport serving as a tool for cooperation in the region still needs to be written. We see now a global trend of co-hosting. The next FIFA World Cup will be co-hosted by the United States, Canada, and Mexico. But of course, you know, uh, also in research, there's so much focus always on the Olympics and the World Cup. And But most sporting events are like tier two, tier three sporting events, regional championships, continental championships. And we see here a trend. So I'm German, for example, when I look in Europe, when I look at recent editions of handball, ice hockey, basketball, European championships, they were all like hosted by two, three, four countries. 
years. And this story still needs to be written for the future. And I hope it will be written because, uh, as we know, also the, the history of Qatar, we just recently witnessing the blockade, has witnessed like many conflicts with neighboring countries. And uh, if, for example, Qatar and Saudi would decide to bid for the Olympic Games, for example, together, I think this could become like a phenomenal regional peace bidding project. Thank you very much, and thank you all for keeping to your time. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions now, if anybody has, yes. Ah, oh, just one minute. Microphone is coming your way. Um, thank you so much, first of all, for the discussion. Um, I do understand that the scope of this discussion is within the World Cup period. However, I was wondering one thing. Like, when you're talking about a lot of this architectural developments and improvements and how there are all these fancy statues and how thousands of rooms were reserved, what will happen, in your opinion, after once the World Cup ends? Do you think all these buildings and fancy statues and these big hotels will still like be able to operate. Do you think in long term, when you're talking about, I think you were mentioning about profit, uh, when you mentioned about the profit, like to what extent do you think the country will profit from this? Are you directing your question at somebody in particular? Um, in general, maybe. Would anyone like to take this question? Yeah, well, I guess all of us have something to say. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's always, you know, a very important question. It's the so what question, what will happen after the World Cup? Um, again, because I'm a, an optimistic person, I believe actually that, first of all, all of this infrastructure will stay. I mean, apart from the parts of the stadiums, actually, which will be removed for reasons that we have just explained. But I think that the World Cup actually will leave a legacy that has to do primarily with how people deal with art, for example, how they how they deal with entertainment. So we know that as part of the World Cup, we have lots of entertainment parks that have been built already, such as the Almaha Island, for example, or some other you know entertainment areas. And we also st have started seeing very visibly instances of public art as well, you know, in some of the most important places here in Qatar. So I think that these actually are aspects that will remain in Qatar after the World Cup. And as a result of this, I have the feeling that if Qatar, you know, deals with it strategically, and of course we can talk about what this means, uh, this might actually trigger lots of people as who will come to Qatar as tourists, you know, art-related tourists, people who just want to have fun, especially people from Saudi Arabia, actually, who can drive now very easily uh, with their families. Um, so, I mean, these are just some of the, the topics, actually, that are relevant to the World Cup. They are not relevant to football as such, but they are relevant to a post-World Cup culture that personally I see being, you know, created at the moment very organically. Uh, and it is also something very safe, uh, you know, entertainment and, well, art less, but entertainment is usually a safe way through which you can exert some sort of, you know, influence by securing tourists, by promoting your country as a fun place to be and to live and so on and so forth. Art is a little bit more controversial. We will have to see actually how it will develop. Uh, but overall, I think that one of the good things about Qatar is that it does not focus on football only. It doesn't see football only as entertainment and as the game itself, right? It uses football in order to create uh, different aspects that will help the country diversify its economy, as Daniel said, or it will help Qatar become more powerful, maybe diplomatically, we will have to wait and see. But I think that it has paved the way already to, you know, to have some sort of impact in the post-World uh, Cup era. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to add as well, um, I believe that the World Cup is, you, you, you can look at the World Cup not as like the end of 
Qatar's uh, continuous efforts, but like just the beginning. So for example, if Qatar did host the uh, World Cup successfully, it kind of showcases to the world that a small country like Qatar was able to host such a mega sporting event and so. And this could actually really help them um, bid for the Olympics because uh, it can show like the world that they already, they can handle such a, a huge uh, magnitude of an, a sporting event. And uh, yeah, uh, just to build on what uh, my colleague said, um, Qatar is trying to not become like a purely sporting hub. Yes, it's investing in sporting hub. It's, invest it's investing to become a sporting hub. And it's also investing to become a cultural hub as well. So it's like part of a continuous effort that's like all around, going all around Qatar, not just like one element to say. Yeah, I think when we talk about the development of the country, the World Cup is over just a small part of it. And most things that happen from education, city, Qatar Airways, um, uh, happen anyway and not because of the World Cup. So um, there is a trajectory of development since the late 1990s, since LNG was started to export. And um, I mean, this... Um, not all of these questions can be answered, of course. For example, I read last week that uh, at this one month to go press conference, I think it was said that there are now 72 pitches, football pitches, uh, and uh, in the in the country built for like you know for practicing for the teams, etc. I know that you know people, for example, uh, in other sports like rugby or cricket, would hope that maybe they can benefit from some of the infrastructure, but that's an open question. It remains to see. But overall, I think the World Cup also sets new standards by recognizing the fact that previous World Cups often left white elephants. So white elephants we call in social sciences infrastructure that is built for a mega event and then not used afterwards anymore. We see now the first of first stadium ever at the World Cup that's just temporarily built, the 974. Lucet will be transformed in a community hub. Other stadiums like Education City Stadium will be reduced in size from 40 to 20,000. As this all has never happened before. Before. Maybe the 20,000 are still too big for this small country, you know, but but still all of this has has never happened before and also by by hosting uh, 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 like more than 10,000 fans, I believe in cruise ships has never happened before. So I think um, recognizing that uh, all the infrastructure that has often been built for mega sporting events was not used afterwards and all like the temporary character of some of the infrastructure that has been built for the World Cup, I think is, is a new development in international sport and sets uh, new standards also for future event hosts. Thank you. Uh, we have a question right here. Sarah, just wait one minute for the microphone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the panel. Uh, my name is Sarah al -Naimi. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at Qatar University. My question is for Dr. Oh, sorry. Like this? No, it's on. It's, it's, on. Also, it's on. Okay. Uh, my name is Sarah Mohana Naimi. I'm a PhD candidate at Qatar University. Um, my question is for Dr. Daniel. Um, I was wondering why there is like less academic uh, focus on uh, the GCC sport diplomacy pre the Kuwaiti invasion, uh, the, the Iraqi invasion for Kuwait. Because obviously um, there has been some kind of supremacy in the GCC uh, sport diplomacy, especially in uh, the Kuwaiti supremacy. We, uh, they always refer to the Kuwaiti football team as the blue team. It has won the Asian Cup of football uh, before the Iraqi invasion. And uh, also it has won a lot of times, you know, a regional uh, football tournament, which is the GCC football tournament. Um, perhaps, perhaps the, uh, let's say, uh, the, the regional competition among uh, Qatar, the UAE, and uh, of course Bahrain with the, uh, the, the, the car rallies to, uh, to start with, perhaps it was like an attempt by the GCC, uh, other smaller states to fill in the gap which was created by the Iraqi invasion to Kuwait. Thank you very much. Well, 
when we look at Qatar sporting history in the in, in the, there is in the in the seventies and eighties, um, Qatar mainly hosted like GCC, uh, Arab. Uh, and some continental events. And the first international event was really in 1993, the ATP tennis tournament that I mentioned that was a clear response to um, Iraq's invasion of, of Kuwait and to start internationalizing Qatar and to, 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 to have some interconnectedness uh, to, to, to other audiences and also recognizing that just to, to reach out to GCC um, is a limitation. Um, and um, by the way, since I worked 12 years before um, in, in Lebanon, when Lebanon was hosting the 1997 um, um, Pan-Arab Games, um, 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 Kuwait uh, and other Arab countries threatened a boycott if Iraq would be allowed to participate. So um, I think the athletes from Iraq, they were already at the Syrian border and then not finally not, not let into to, to, to Lebanon um, to, to prevent a boycott from, from Kuwait and, and some, some, some other countries. Thank you. At the back there. Madam, at the back. Um, okay. Uh, this is more of an open question for everyone. So my question is, why do you think Qatar picked sports as its tipping, its spare tip of foreign policy? You see in other examples of city-states like Singapore and Hong Kong investing a lot in its financial sector and bringing international investments in. And they would, I would say, put a relatively less focus on hosting mega sports events like the World Cup. So why do you think that Qatar has chosen to take on this such a big endeavor that um, may or may not, you know, be successful in the next month where the World Cup starts? So, you know, why did they choose to host this event? Thank you. That is a question that gets to the core of the issue. Why sports? Yeah, it's a very pertinent question. Um, again, as a person who has been living and working here for the past 12 and a half years, actually, I can't help but noticing how much uh, emphasis Qatar has been placing on sports in general, not only football. So uh, I would say that sports diplomacy is a safe way of doing diplomacy in the sense that sports actually are supposed to bring people together. So by nature, you know, the mission is very unificatory, if you will. But uh, football in particular, I would say, can be seen as a powerful way of, you know, branding yourself and of trying to achieve your diplomatic mission, if you will, exactly because it is a very simple sport and therefore it is accessible to everyone regardless of social class, regardless of, you know, nationality, regardless of ethnicity and so on and so forth. So it is everywhere. Right? Something that if you use as a country strategically, basically it can make you visible everywhere, even to parts of this world where you are not widely known. And I think that one of the things actually that Qatar is trying to achieve through the World Cup is to make itself visible, to make itself known uh, in parts of the world that don't usually interact with Qatar, right? Uh, diplomatically, financially, and so on and so forth. So this is one thing. And the other thing also has to do with the fact that like all sports, Football actually has some very clear values. So you have this idea of having a hierarchy. Whatever happens on the pitch, it can be resolved by just following whatever the referee will tell you. You respect that, right? Uh, so I think that this idea actually is very close to how the political system of Qatar is, so the concept of authority, right? So the nature of the sport actually is an, in alignment with the whole political structure of Qatar. So I think that this might be also one of the reasons why Qatar has found football so uh, appealing. And last but not least, like with all sports, uh, football is the sport of hope, right? And I think that in general, part of the mission of Qatar is to instill some sort of hope, hope to its 
rich citizens, hope to its residents, but also hope all over the world. I mean, um, I don't know if you know this, I read about it only very recently, that when Qatar actually placed a bid for the World Cup, it prepared a file whose name was Peace from the Middle East or something like that, right? So hope, I think, actually goes hand in hand with peace. And exactly because Qatar knows that it is geographically located in an area which is where you know you have lots of turmoil. I think that it it wants to 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 transmit the message that we can coexist harmoniously. We can coexist peacefully with other nations as well. Uh, and I think that in order to transfer this message in a way which is efficient, uh, in the way that you know will hopefully help Qatar take its message all over the world, is through football. Exactly because of the accessibility of the sport. So um, nothing moves people around the globe as much as sport, and particularly football. It's the most globalized sport. Of course, there are some countries where it's not the sport number one, but overall, no other sport is in so many countries the number one. And um, Qatar, you know, has hosted a number of events. Uh, it has also um, uh, sponsored a number of events. It has even purchased a club. Um, but I, uh, you know, when we when we look at um, Qatar's approach uh, as a small state, and it has found this niche, and for Dubai it's tourism, and for others it's like banking or humanitarian efforts. So small states uh, try to identify their niche to to for for everything I mentioned before, visibility, influence, etc. But of course, uh, we cannot limit uh, Qatar's entire foreign policy to sport. So um, providing other countries with energy security is key. So far, it has mainly applied to providing energy security to Southeast Asian countries. But now with the expansion of the North Fleet, this will become also more a topic of um, interactions with European countries. There's so far UK and Poland already getting Qatari gas, but it will be more countries like my country, Germany, who will get uh, LNG from Qatar in the future. Um, we have... Um, Al Jazeera, very important uh, now since more than 25 years. Qatar Airways, all of them uh, contributing to the interconnectedness. But I think Hissa can elaborate a bit also on, on other pillars of, of, of Qatar's foreign policy that are important for the country. Um, definitely, I agree that it's not just sports. Um, for example, now, especially after the new Emir, uh, Sheikh uh, Tamim bin Hamad, came to power. He has really been focusing on really restoring Qatar's mediation roots and uh, engaging in mediation and diplomacy as a form of soft, soft power. And you can see that in the successful case of Afghanistan and the recent Chadian uh, mediation and so and so. And also the one with uh, Egypt to restore peace to Gaza. And so it's definitely not just sports, but sports does is like... Qatar's aim of being a sporting hub. And you said, uh, you asked the question of why is it sports? Uh, and is, why is Qatar uh, trying to become a sporting hub? I actually think it's not just Qatar. Even the rest of the countries are trying to hop on like this uh, trend train. You can say, for example, the Formula One, the golf tournaments in the in the neighboring countries and so. So it's it's a really a really good way for these countries to gain soft power, I guess, and you know, because engaging in this like niche power, I guess. In fact, just today we published uh, Hissa's blog on uh, foreign policy in the World Cup, so you can find that on our website as well. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Dr. Daniel. Uh, my name is Deepak. I specialize in international relations. So I do agree with uh, sports being an effective part of soft power diplomacy. But having said that, sports is also uh, an avenue of intense nationalism when nationalism is exhibited. And, uh, you know, geopolitical rivalries can spill to the field or it could be the other way around, a gesture or something which happens in the field can create a diplomatic incident. I mean, these could be random incidents, but 
we live in a world of uh, you know with the proliferation of social media and there's been n number of events uh, which happen so how do we you know it's not just particular to qatar but how do nations navigate that thin line between you know how to balance it thank you I agree one should not make a general statement like sport is a force for good or always contributes to peace and a better understanding um it depends on the context and there are examples for both um i mean uh for example when when we read in my classes like uh, uh um introductory uh, readings on on sport and international relations one example that always comes up is a ping pong diplomacy so the first visit of a us president to china was like around a table tennis match um, between the two countries um and there are also other examples uh, like um, between turkey and armenia for example where like sport has been integrated into um um building diplomatic relations but there are also many cases where sport contributed to fuel tensions between countries so no general statement can be made it always depends on the context yeah thank you yunus over here thank you my name is yunus i'm from ghana embassy um for me i came to qatar in december last year and indeed you see that qatar is more of an oasis of peace because you feel it you have the security you have the quietness and the tranquility and even when you go to the malls and everywhere you feel the peace you feel the security even when you go somewhere you do not afraid to leave your bag here and there it's something that uh maybe we take for granted now the message going to all the fans mostly is when the fans come in to qatar they should behave this way so so and so but what is the message to the residents how are we going to handle this peace that we take so much for granted because different people from different geographical regions and everybody else is coming here uh how safe are we how do we protect this peace that is so much transient in society thank you does anybody want to take on that question are you talking about the england fans specifically <laughs> how are we going to handle 1.5 million fans coming to qatar is that just a comment or a question I just have influence on the two friends who visit me so I will make sure they behave well. We can do like these small steps like Daniel said. I think that actually this is an area which in my humble opinion is a little bit problematic. I don't think that you know as residents and as people you know like the Qatari nationals know what exactly you know they should be expecting during the World Cup. I think that this is an area actually that needs more improvement if you will. But um having said that I think that we could try and be as much adaptive as possible. I mean for starters you know people who work in education will be off so they have holidays which basically means that lots of people actually who work in the education business actually will most probably leave the country however some mothers actually have decided to stay here for the fun of the game uh, some people actually will be volunteering as well for the event So I think that we can just carry on and do business as usual as much as possible of course because obviously the life of everybody will be uh, affected uh, again and this comes from a person who tries to be optimistic I would say that we you know we could try and enjoy Qatar we could try and do things that we would not normally do so for example we can cycle from our place to go to the corniche because we know that it will be uh, problematic in terms of traffic right and we could try to make contact with some of the visitors that we will be visiting qatar we could try and give them some further information about qatar right uh, these are small steps uh, things that might you know we might not have thought about but i think that they might make a difference in terms of 
our lives and in terms of how we will be dealing with uh, this period. For me, the biggest concern actually has to do primarily with the healthcare. And this is something that we have been discussing actually in other panels as well. Uh, we don't know actually whether the, the healthcare infrastructure is ready to deal with, you know, cases of funds, for example, who might faint or who might consume, you know, extensive alcohol and so on and so forth. So I think that this is one of the areas where ideally we should get more information soon in order how to, to deal with them. Um, I think you asked a very important question and honestly that's something we all want to know. Um, but uh, I've... In my opinion, some of the measures that have been taken to kind of limit the chaos from happening is the fan zones and, for example, uh, how uh, they res they're they going to restrict drinking alcohol to just these fan zones. And I feel like these are some measures that are trying to limit uh, like the chaotic energy from really overspilling anywhere, everywhere else. And yeah, and hopefully, uh, as Irene said, that we just have to be adaptive and, you know, we have to remember that's just going to be for one month, hopefully, and the peace will be restored, uh, inshallah. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the front. Good evening. First of all, I want to express the happiness for joining this event, especially I've been in Qatar since the last 32 years. So I know how Qatar was and how Qatar is and how Qatar will be. I have the chance to be a volunteer in the Asian game 2006. And now currently I'm also a volunteer in FIFA 2022. I would like to answer the gentleman in the back, why sports? If you look at what was happening in South Africa and how did Mandela unify and give a good impression about the new South Africa, it's through the cricket, right? The championship of the world was won by South Africa there. Now, since 9-11, there was a very bad image about this region, especially the Gulf. What else? And an alternative other than sport to give the real image of Qatar and the Gulf. It's not only for tourists. It's just to show how the social habits here, how the norms, how the real Arabs are living, how the neighboring country in the Middle East are living. I'm sorry to say it, but not out of being criticizing, but just for clarifying how Muslims are, how they are living in Qatar, in Saudi Arabia, and the neighboring country, not the terrorist. Qatar introduced international events since 1994. There was the tennis, then the racquetball, the golf, the Asian game. A lot of international events happen just to show that Qatar and the Gulf are peaceful through introducing the, what you say, the safe atmosphere we are living in. Believe me, when I came to Qatar and up to now, I don't lock my door. Once I forgot my door and I went to the desert for two days and the key was still in the door. Regarding the preparation for 2022, we have been through many drills in FIFA. We have witnessed how the crowd will be in the airport and how the crowd will be if they are troublesome, how the crowd will be if they are misbehaving or acting drunk. Many drills and soon at the 1st of November, I will be having a drill in the, uh, uh, the, the last and the biggest fan area on the Corniche. By the way, the Corniche will be closed. Believe me, Qatar is prepared since they have submitted the bid. And they, about the 1.5 million, you can go and took a look around in Qatar. How many hotels are still occupant? How many apartments have been assigned? Two gigantic chips will be coming here as a floating hotels. Plus, Qatar made 
an agreement with the neighboring country to have one day trip from UAE, from Bahrain, from Saudi Arabia. You can live in, in, in Dubai and come to Qatar with one day trip. And you don't even need visas, right? Didn't we read that in your blog today? Thank so, you very much. It's so great to hear from this, an actual volunteer. I don't think we've heard from a volunteer. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, they are really trying to encourage the good image of Qatar and the neighboring countries. Absolutely. And the tourism is the only way to show what we are and how we are. Absolutely agreed. Give me, I have two daughters here. They were studying in Qatar University, no, I mean in Qatar Foundation one in uh, Virginia. Yes. She used to come home at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Thank I didn't you, worry sir. about her, but if I live in my country in Lebanon, I have to get, to get two bodyguards for her. Yeah. No, really, that's the truth. No, and absolutely. When she went to Virginia, the main campus, they send them an email, please be back, be back to the dorm before 6 p.m. Thank so, you for your you comment, know. sir. I think we have another question. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your comment. Hello, um, I'm a researcher at Qatar University, so we are doing some research about the question that I want to ask, but um, I'm just, uh, I would like to hear everybody's opinion on this. What do you think are going to be the cultural implications of the, you know, in the long term of FIFA? Because I, like everybody has said, this is not the first sporting event that Qatar has hosted, even it is a mega sporting event in comparison to the F1 and, you know, the op tennis open and so on. But Considering this is a one month long thing and the amount of tourists are who are going to come, like some of the topics we've talked about, um, drinking and like we in Qatar, usually we are actually kind of a conservative society. There is a dress code, there is a behavioral code, and there is, a, you know, even in speech and dialect and so on, there is all these societal norms that we follow silently. Now for an entire month, this is going to change and probably for another two weeks after that, what are going to be the long-term implications of this culturally, societally, that, you know, as a society, we all will face? I think, I think the, the, the country is, is, is changing, but we cannot relate all these changes to the FIFA World Cup. And um, many uh, of the changes have started before 2010, before Qatar was awarded the World Cup. And um, I mean, um, for example, when it comes to, to uh, female education, for example, we cannot say this is like related to, to the World Cup. So we have 70% of the students we admitted this academic years were women. And this is an overall trend in, in education city. And I'm sure, uh, I don't know the numbers from Qatar University, but they are similar. So I think uh, changes are, are happening. Uh, we have also discussed at other occasions for another project like there is more of an individualization happening, which we can see, for example, with 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 the dress codes. You know, it's becoming far more colorful, for example. Um, and um, so, but I would not relate these changes to 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 the World Cup. So I think we have an ongoing uh, process of uh, modernization, but the country is modernizing at its own terms. So as an uh, example of, of dress codes, for example, shows, it's not like a modernization in the sense of that from one day to another women would dress like Westerners, but, but you know, the abayas have changed over the, since I've been the first time in Qatar, since 2004, different colors, different designs. So the country is changing, but on its own terms. This is actually a topic that is of great interest to me also in terms of my research interests. Uh, yes, I agree with Daniel that it's not only because of the World Cup that we are currently seeing rapid sociocultural changes. For me, you know, a milestone actually was the, the blockade. After the blockade, actually, we started seeing lots of uh, extensive cultural changes in the sense that people, you know, started becoming much more uh, acceptable towards other cultures. Uh, we started actually seeing lots of 
languages in the linguistic landscape of Qatar, apart from Arabic and uh, English only. I mean, these are examples of cultural changes. But when we talk about the World Cup in particular, we can just speculate on what kind of changes uh, we should be expecting. The way I see the impact of World Cup on the culture of Qatar is that it will leave its you know, imprint in the whole world, which basically means that, you know, people will start talking about Qatar and maybe people will start visiting Qatar. So we, you know, most probably we will start seeing lots of tourists coming uh, into Qatar and not only as a layover destination, but some of them actually will most probably want to spend some time here, mainly three or four days, for example. So we will definitely start seeing more foreigners, and when I say foreigners, I don't mean only expats, I mean tourists, right? People who look around and they wonder where they are. So this already will change actually the culture of the country in the sense that like we always do in this country, you know, most probably we want to help these people. We will like to show them around. So I think that, you know, this sort of change in the human landscape of the country actually might trigger behavioral changes as well. It might, you know, the World Cup actually might be seen as a catalyst that will make us improve our behavior towards other people more. This is one cultural change that I anticipate. And the other cultural change has to do actually with the, the dominance of Arabic and the visibility of uh, Arabic language as well. Um, I have the feeling that exactly because Qatar will start gaining lots of visibility, basically this means that, for example, in terms of popular culture, this is something that is of great interest to me research-wise, culture, like at the level of popular culture, we might start seeing uh, Qatar figuring more prominently. So in terms of the production of songs, for example, in terms of the production of movies, we have already started seeing that through Doha Film. Film Institute, for instance, but exactly because of this global visibility that the country will uh, attract, right? I have the feeling that it will start, uh, you know, investing more in these fields, in music, in film, maybe in theater, I don't know. But at any rate, I have the feeling that Arabic language and the Qatari dialect or the Haliji dialects overall, the Gulf dialects, will start becoming more prominently in uh, in popular culture. So this is another cultural change that I would anticipate after the World Cup. And um, I just wanted to add, like, uh, like I, I believe it's a very good example you could look into, is how um, uh, the 2022 World Cup actually, in my opinion, uh, allowed girls to go into stadiums. So. It, although it's not banned like by the state itself, culturally, uh, girls were not really, um, they didn't really like uh, for girls to go to these stadiums. And Qatar has always had like a popular uh, football uh, culture. And men would always go to the stadiums. My father would go to stadiums. My brothers would go to stadiums. But the women never actually went into stadiums. But one thing that I saw is that personally, me, myself uh, as well, uh, as we are like closer to the World Cup, I actually went to my first ever football match uh, last month. And it was very exciting to say the least. And um, I know a lot of other girls, like uh, friends and family who are actually going to attend matches in the 2022 World Cup as well. So I believe that's one very good example of a cultural change that happened in Qatar due to the 2022 World Cup. Thank you. We have time for about one more question. Yes, please, sir, at the back. So this is more of a general uh, general question to all. Um, how will other countries project Qatar's image after the World Cup, um, especially if it does become successful? Like, uh, will the international community actually continue to hype up um, Qatar? Or will this sort of energy be enclosed within um, the World Cup only? And uh, will the World Cup actually also help uh, breaking the stigma between like the Arab countries? And another, this might sound a little bit um, pessimistic, but for example, if the, um, the World Cup doesn't really become that successful. What could be the implications to this, especially towards the future of sports here in Qatar? So, a question that wants some predictions. Daniel. 
Social scientists are good in explaining the past, but have always failed in predicting the future. But um, when it comes to the perception of Qatar, that's a good question. So in uh, 2014, I spent a semester at Harvard and I had the opportunity uh, to have a conversation with Professor Joseph Nye, who invented the concept of soft power. And I asked him, what do you think about these soft power indexes that have been created based on your research? And he said, I'm very skeptical about it because uh, this gives the impression that this is like a mathematical formula where you add like this sporting event with building that museum and then you gain soft power. But the problem of soft power is it doesn't depend on, on the sender, it's on the receiving end. The receiving end decides whether how they perceive a country. So it's hard to say. But overall, I would say that, um, ironically, Qatar has achieved most of its objective already before the World Cup has started. Qatar's standing in the world is better than ever before. Hissa mentioned Qatar's efforts to um, uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Qatar helped evacuating 10,000s of people and helped saving the life of 10,000s of people. Many Western embassies like the American one, the German one and others have relocated from Kabul to Doha. Uh, Qatar is helping now an increasing number of countries in their energy security. So I think Qatar standing in the world is already pretty good, but I think there is a gap between elites and the grassroots level. When we see, for example, in my country, Germany, Bayern Munich fans protesting against Qatar Airways sponsorship, for example. So there is a gap. I think if we would make a survey amongst like foreign ministries all over the world, I think the outcome of the survey might be pretty positive because people know Qatar respects international law, is an active, uh, good global citizen, um, a reliable energy provider, helping in conflicts, mediating conflicts. So I think the elites uh, the, uh, know all of this. But at the grassroots level, there is some more opposition, um, which is, I believe, a mix of uh, Orientalist stereotypes and Islamophobia, uh, but also concern for real issues that, uh, you know, like the treatment of the uh, migrant workers, um, et cetera. Now, recently, there's lots of discussion on LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, so uh, there's also a real, real concern for some, for some issues. So, but there is this gap between, I think, perception by elites and on the grassroots level. So I believe that answering your question is a bit difficult to give you like an exact concrete answer. But what we can do instead is like look at it if Qatar hosted a successful World Cup and if it did not. So if Qatar does host a successful World Cup, this does benefit Qatar greatly and it uh, increases their visibility and uh, their soft power and so and so. However, if they don't host a successful World Cup for any reason, God forbid, um, it does uh, increase the chances of soft disempowerment. So basically it's like where the country would always be remembered now for this failed mega sporting event. And this would affect them not only just like one year later or two years later in the long run, this would always be, Qatar would always be remembered for like the failed World Cup. And so it's a risk, but it could very well be worth the risk to take to host such a mega sporting event. The only comment I would like to make is that Qatar will not fail. It will succeed because, I mean, again, if we look at its sports-related history since 2006, we see that despite all of this criticism, actually it has managed to, to be pretty successful. In the unlikely event, actually, that something wrong happens, I think that Qatar is prepared, actually, to deal with all sorts of different crises that we cannot even predict right now, right? I mean, in terms of, you know, how to deal with, let's say, diplomatic crises, it has passed, you know, successfully many crash tests. So I don't see any reason why it would fail a potential crisis. And I think that even if something, you know, really wrong happens, God forbid, as Hesa said, uh, I'm pretty sure that it will try to do the best it can in order to rectify the situation like it did with the Hisar, with the blockade. And I think that this will remain, right, uh, as an indelible sign in the global sphere. People will see actually how Qatar tried to deal with this situation. Exactly because, as I told you, it has passed successfully lots of tests. I want to believe that it will make it this time as well. And 
sometimes, you know, the image that we live uh, is the outcome not of how successful we've been, but it is the, the, the sign that we live as people, as people who are vulnerable and who were asked to deal with crisis and they managed to do it successfully. On that very optimistic note, please help me thank our speakers.